Shaler North Hills Library, and we are going to do a program on the Greek myths. Every week we'll learn a little bit more about some of the different gods in Greek mythology. So I'm really excited about this. I think it will be really fun to learn about all these different names that you hear about, may not know anything about, or that you've never heard of, but they're still around and people still learn about them thousands of years later. So let's see why. Let's see what's so exciting about them. We're going to be reading from a book, Dalar's Book of Greek Myths. It's one of the most famous books for kids written about Greek mythology. I'm ashamed to show you my copy because it's really old and beat up. But the one at the library was checked out and I didn't get to get a different one. I'm going to show you some other books too later on that are much nicer with beautiful pictures and everything, but this is still a classic that you can't go wrong reading about. And let's get started. Here's a map of Greece that you can check out online. In olden times, when men still worshiped ugly idols, there lived in the land of Greece a folk of shepherds and herdsmen who cherished light and beauty. They did not worship dark idols like their neighbors, but created instead their own beautiful radiant gods. The Greek gods looked much like people and acted like them too, only they were taller, handsomer, and could do no wrong. Fire-breathing monsters and beasts with many heads stood for all that was dark and wicked. There were for gods and great heroes to conquer. The gods lived on top of Olympus, a mountain so high and steep that no man could climb it and see them in their shining palace. But they often descended to earth, sometimes in their own shape, sometimes disguised as humans or animals. Mortals worshipped the gods, and the gods honored Mother Earth. They had all sprung from her, for she was the beginning of all life. Gaia, the earth, came out of darkness so long ago that nobody knows when or how. Earth was young and lonesome, for nothing lived on her yet. Above her rose Uranus, the sky, dark and blue, set all over with sparkling stars. He was magnificent to behold, and young Earth looked up at him and fell in love with him. Sky smiled down at Earth, twinkling with his countless stars, and they were joined in love. Soon, young Earth became Mother Earth, the mother of all things living. All her children loved their warm and bountiful mother and feared their mighty father, Uranus, Lord of the Universe. The Titans. The Titans were the first children of Mother Earth. They were the first gods, taller than the mountains she created to serve them as thrones, and both Earth and sky were proud of them. There were six titans, six glorious gods, and they had six sisters, the titanesses, whom they took for their wives. When Gaia again gave birth, Uranus was not proud. Their new children were also huge, but each had only one glowing eye set in the middle of his forehead. They were the three cyclopes, and they were named Lightning, Thunder, and Thunderbolt. They were not handsome gods, but tremendously strong smiths. Sparks from their heavy hammers flashed across the sky and lit up the heavens so brightly that even their father's stars faded. After a while, Mother Earth bore three more sons. Uranus looked at them with disgust. Each of them had 50 heads and a 100 strong arms. He hated to see such ugly creatures walk about on lovely Earth. So he seized them and their brothers, the Cyclops, and flung them into Tartarus, the deepest, darkest pit under the earth. 
Mother Earth loved her children and could not forgive her husband for his cruelty to them. Out of hardest flinch, she fastened a sickle and spoke to her sons, the Titans. Take this weapon, make an end to your father's cruelty, and set your brothers free. Fear took hold of five of the Titans, and they trembled and refused. Only Cronus, the youngest but strongest, dared to take the sickle. He fell upon his father. Uranus could not withstand the weapon wielded by his strong son, and he fled, giving up his powers. Mother Earth made Pontus the boundless sea her second husband, and from this union sprang the gods of the watery depths, and from her rich ground grew an abundance of trees and flowers, and out of her crevices, sprites, beasts, and early man crept forth. Cronus was now the lord of the universe. He sat on the highest mountain and ruled over heaven and earth with a firm hand. The other gods obeyed his will, and early man worshipped him. This was man's golden age. Men lived happily and in peace with the gods and each other. They did not kill, and they had no locks on their doors, for theft had not yet been invented. But Cronus did not set his monstrous brothers free, and Mother Earth was angry with him and plotted his downfall. She had to wait, for no god yet born was strong enough to oppose him. But she knew that one of his sons would be stronger than he, just as Cronus had been stronger than his father. Cronus knew it too, so every time his titanous wife, Rhea, gave birth, he took the newborn god and swallowed it. With all of his offspring safely inside him, he had nothing to fear. But Rhea mourned. Her five sisters, who had married the five other titans, were surrounded by their titan children, while she was all alone. When Rhea expected her sixth child, she asked Mother Earth to help her save the child from his father. That was just what Mother Earth had been waiting for. She gave her daughter whispered advice, and Rhea went away smiling. As soon as Rhea had borne her child, the god Zeus, she hid him. Then she wrapped a stone in baby clothes and gave it to her husband to swallow instead of her son. Cronus was fooled and swallowed the stone and the little god Zeus was spirited away to a secret cave on the island of Crete. Old Cronus never heard the cries of his young son, for Mother Earth set noisy earth sprites outside the cave. They made such a clatter, beating their shields with their swords, that other sounds were drowned out. Zeus and his family Zeus was tended by gentle nymphs and was nursed by the fairy goat Amalthea. From the horns of the goat flowed ambrosia and nectar, the food and drink of the gods. Zeus grew rapidly, and it was not long before he strode out of the cave as a great new god. To thank the nymphs for tending him so well, he gave them the horns of the goat. They were horns of plenty and could never be emptied. From the hide of the goat, he made for himself an impenetrable breastplate, the Aegis, and now he was so strong that Cronus could do nothing against him. Young Zeus chose Metis, a titan's daughter, for his first wife. She was the goddess of prudence, that means being smart, and he needed her good advice. She warned him not to try alone to overthrow his child-devouring father, for Cronus had all the other titans and their sons on his side. First, Zeus must also have strong allies, I mean strong friends. Metis went to Cronus and cunningly tricked him into eating a magic herb. He thought the herb would make him unconquerable. Instead, it made him so sick, he vomited up not only the stone he had swallowed, but his five other children as well. They were the gods Hades and Poseidon and the goddess Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, all mighty gods who right away joined forces with Zeus. When Cronus saw the six young gods rising against him, he knew that his hour had come, and he surrendered his powers and fled. Now Zeus was the lord of the universe. 
He did not want to rule alone. He shared his powers with his brothers and sisters. But the Titans and their sons revolted. They refused to let themselves be ruled by the new gods. Only Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus left the Titans to join Zeus, for Prometheus could look into the future and he knew that Zeus would win. Zeus freed the monstrous sons of Mother Earth from Tartarus. Gratefully, the hundred armed ones fought for him with all their strength, and the Cyclopes forged mighty weapons for him and his brothers. They made a trident for Poseidon. It was so forceful that when he struck the ground with it, the earth shook, and when he struck the sea, frothing waves stood mountain high. For Hades, they made a cap of invisibility so he could strike his enemies unseen, and for Zeus, they forged lightning bolts. Armed with them, he was the mightiest god of all. Nothing could stand against him and his thunderbolts. The Titans fought a bitter battle, but at last they had to surrender, and Zeus locked them up in Tartarus. The hundred armed monsters went to stand guard at the gates to see that they never escaped. Atlas, the strongest of the Titans, was sent to the end of the world to carry forever the vault of the sky on his shoulders. Angry with Zeus for sending her sons, the Titans, into the dark pit of Tartarus, Mother Earth was now brought forth two terrible monsters, Typhon and his mate Echidna, and sent them against Zeus. They were so fearful that when the gods saw them, they changed themselves into animals and fled in terror. Typhon's hundred horrible heads touched the stars, venom dripping from his evil eyes, and lava and red-hot stones poured from his gaping mouths. Hissing like a hundred snakes and roaring like a hundred lions, he tore up whole mountains and threw them at the gods. Zeus was re soon regained his courage and turned, and when the other gods saw him taking his stand, they came back to help him fight the monster. A terrible battle raged, and hardly a living creature was left on earth. But Zeus was fated to win, and as Typhon tore up huge Mount Etna to hurl at the gods, Zeus struck it with a hundred well-aimed thunderbolts, and the mountain fell back, pinning Typhon underneath. There the monster lies to this very day, belching fire, lava, and smoke through the top of the mountain. Echidna, his hideous mate, escaped destruction. She cowered in a cave, protecting Typhon's dreadful offspring. And Zeus let them live as a challenge to future heroes. Now at last Mother Earth gave up her struggle. There were no more upheavals, and the wounds of the war soon healed. The mountains still firmly stood firmly anchored. The seas had their shores, the rivers had their riverbeds, and river gods watched over them. And each tree and each spring had its nymph. The earth again was green and fruitful, and Zeus could begin to rule in peace. The one-eyed Cyclops were not only smiths, but masons as well and they built a towering palace for the gods on top of Mount Olympus, for it was the highest mountain in Greece. The palace was hidden in clouds, and the goddesses of the seasons rolled them away whenever a god wanted to down, go down to earth. Nobody else could pass through the gate of clouds. Iris, the fleet-footed messenger of the gods, had her own path down to earth, Dressed in a gown of iridescent drops, she ran along the rainbow on her busy errands between Olympus and Earth. In the gleaming hall of the palace, where light never failed, the Olympian gods sat on twelve golden thrones and reigned over heaven and earth. There were twelve great gods, for Zeus shared his powers not only with his brothers and sisters, but with six of his children and the goddess of love as well. Zeus himself sat on the highest throne with a bucket full of thunderbolts beside him. On his right sat his youngest sister, Hera, whom he had chosen from all his wives as his queen. Beside her sat her son Ares, god of war, and Hephaestus, god of fire, with Aphrodite, goddess of love, between them. Next was Zeus's son Hermes, the herald of the gods, and Zeus's sister Demeter, goddess of the harvest, with her daughter Persephone on her lap. 
On the left of Zeus sat his brother Poseidon, the lord of the sea. Next to him sat the four children of Zeus, Athena, the twins Apollo and Artemis, and Dionysus, the youngest of the gods. Athena was the goddess of wisdom, Apollo the god of light and music, Artemis goddess of the hunt, and Dionysus the god of wine. Hestia, the eldest sister of Zeus, was goddess of the hearth. She had no throne, but tended the sacred fire in the hall, and every hearth on earth was her altar. She was the gentlest of all the Olympians. Hades, the eldest brother of Zeus, was the lord of the dead. He preferred to stay in his gloomy palace in the underworld and never went to Olympus. The gods themselves could not die, for divine ichor flowed in their veins instead of blood. Most of the time they lived happily together, feasting on sweet-smelling ambrosia and nectar. But when their wills clashed, there were violent quarrels. Then Zeus would reach for a thunderbolt, and the Olympians would tremble and fall to order, for Zeus alone was stronger than all the other gods together. So that tells us a little bit about how it all began. And we are focusing on Zeus and Hera this week. I think we learned enough about Zeus for right now, but we're going to take a brief look at Hera, goddess of marriage and fertility. This is another book that's wonderful, Treasury, National Geographic, Treasury of Greek Mythology, Classic Stories of Gods, Goddesses, Heroes, and Monsters. And it's got beautiful illustrations. Let's read a story about Hera. Hera was the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, so she had gotten off to a bad start, swallowed by her father and all. But she didn't think much about her early life, nor did she care much about the interminable war between the Olympians and the Titans that commenced almost immediately after she and her siblings were freed. No, none of that mattered. Life really started for Hera when she put on her gold sandals and strutted before that brother of hers, Zeus. An oh, glorious moment. He looked at her in that way of his. She was energized. He was a handsome devil. But he turned out to be a troublesome one, too. It would have been a jewel in her crown if she'd been his first wife. But then Zeus drank his first wife, that ill-fated nymph Metis, and they called her wise, huh? So no, 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 better not have been the first. But then he went on to a titan wife with a body larger than his, imagine, and then another nymph, and then of all things, his own sister Demeter, and next he took Leto, the daughter of titans. This devilish god was worse than a billy goat, and he was driving Hera to distraction. Most mortifying of all, that doe-eyed Leto bore him a son. It was Hera who should have borne his first son. Everything was going wrong. But Hera played it smart. No one should guess her smoldering anger. She wore an innocent smile and carried herself as though basking in the admiration of the whole world. Everyone fell for it. She must be a beauty if she walked like that. And Zeus fell harder than anyone. He called Hera the most precious blossom he'd ever seen. She pinched her cheeks to darken them, as if the blush of modesty, and looked out at him from under long lashes. He needed her, but she wouldn't yield until he made her not just his wife, but his queen. Queen Hera, the only true wife of King Zeus. Zeus was hers at last. But what did he do? Without missing a beat, he moved from Hera's embrace to in the embrace of Maya, the daughter of silly Atlas, who bore the heavens on his shoulder girdle, and the granddaughter of Titans. Hera could predict the future, one simpering female after another in Zeus's arms. She vowed then and there to have revenge on every single future rival into eternity. In fact, she would teach a lesson to anyone who helped Zeus meet other wives. Her punishments would be severe. They'd give pause. And then the worst thing happened. Zeus had drunk that first wife, Metis, and no one had ever given her another thought. 
But now, so long after, Zeus doubled over in pain, and the next thing Hera knew, this, this thing burst from his forehead, a goddess in full armor. Zeus had given birth to his daughter, Athena, all on his own. Oh, that wasn't really the case. No one could believe that. A male had no such powers. Females were the ones who could have babies. Hera's grandfather had tried to stop her grandmother from giving birth by forcing the children to stay inside their mother. Hera's father had tried to rob her mother of the benefits of giving birth by swallowing her babies as they were born. And now Hera's husband, who was also her brother, and thus the inheritor of that behavior, had claimed the ability of giving birth himself. It was all part of one giant effort to strip women. Ridiculous. Athena was the result of Metis giving birth inside Zeus. She was not the product of Zeus alone. Though every other insult was hateful, this one was truly intolerable. In a rage, Hera closed in upon herself, concentrating all her energies on one tiny dot within her. Her grandmother Gaia had done it before her. Need. It was all a question of need. Hera practically melted with need, and yes, triumph. Life began within her, and this time it really was all on her own. A woman could do it all on her own. Hera would give birth to the god Hephaestus, her first child, and the one that would be totally and completely hers. No matter what Zeus did, he couldn't rob her of that. Hera was always furious at Zeus's romance. One was with the priestess Io. Zeus turned Io into a white cow to protect her from Hera, but Hera asked Zeus for the cow as a gift, and she made the giant Argus guard her. Argus had a hundred eyes. Some eyes slept, while others kept watch. Zeus had Hermes kill Argus and free Io. In grief, Hera set Argus's eyes in the peacock's tail and she sent a gadfly to torment Io and drive her away from Zeus. So Hera seeks to get revenge, but sometimes it backfires. So that just gives you a small idea of the type of person Hera was. Of course, Zeus wasn't much better, but they were both extremely powerful. Okay, we will talk about some other gods next week. This one was longer because we had to get started at the very beginning. How did this all Greek myth thing get started? And who were the early fathers and mothers of Greek mythology? So let's take a look at the Greek myth week one packet. If you printed that out, Zeus and Hera, there are coloring pages in a separate printout that you can do one for all of the gods and we're only going to do the first two this week Hera and Zeus and then we will go through and do other ones each week as we go trying to find them here in my packet okay we also had a coloring page for Rhea and Cronus, and there she is handing him the baby that is not a baby. It's actually a rock wrapped up so that he can take that. And then we have a coloring sheet for, let me find Zeus in here. Zeus sitting on his third up on Mount Olympus. And then we have Hera, who is also ruling on her throne with the peacock nearby that we talked about. Peacocks are known for being kind of proud birds, we say. And that's why a peacock is her symbol. So those would be the three coloring sheets to do for this week. And then we also have... In my sheet that tells what we were doing this week. Uh, go. We are going to make a Greek God family tree and add to it each week as we go, or if you want to do the whole thing right now, you can do that too. So we have these sheets to color. This sheet, I should say. 
is a very long one. And if you printed it out on two sheets of paper, it doesn't matter. You can just cut them apart. And if a person printed in the middle, you need to tape that together, you can do that. But we have each of the gods here that we are going to be learning about up on Mount Olympus. And all you need to do, they show you a picture of how we are going to do this. A family tree shows you how families are related. So I gave you this sample one here. We have Gaia and Uranus up at the top. We have Cronus and Rhea. We don't have coloring pictures of them. I only gave you coloring pictures of the 14 gods and goddesses up on Mount Olympus. So you can just write in their names. Gaia, they drew a picture of Mother Earth, or the planet Earth, as you can see. And Uranus, they drew a sky because he was supposed to be the sky god. And then there's Cronus, was the male titan who overthrew his father, and he married Rhea as his wife. So you can just do a printout if you want printouts of them, too. Find some little person on the internet and print out their picture and color them in. But I did give you the ones that are going to come underneath. And all you need to do, if you don't have a sheet of paper big enough to go all the way across like that on, I would simply use two regular size sheets and you can tape them together. I did bring tape in with me. Let me get my tape here. And you can quite easily then fit them all going across when you have them taped together. Some of you may not have the big size paper at home and may not want to go out and get it. So there are ways to make do. And then color in the Greek gods. If you want to, like I said, do all of them this week, you can. Or if you just want to do Hera and Zeus, you can do that and glue in the others as we go. I usually like to do things that are this small with colored pencil, but you can certainly use whatever colors or tools you want. I'm not going to do a very good job because I know that I'm not the best color, but you can do as much detail as you want on them. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of how it works. And color in each of the gods said there were 12 thrones because Hades ruled down in the world of the dead and Hestia did not even need a throne. She was happy to sit by the fire and just be a goddess of, well, I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to learn about that in future weeks. Okay, so again, I just did a very, very rough job of the gods for this week. And I'm going to cut them out. And then we're going to draw a line. A family tree shows who is married to who and then whose children there are that those husband and wife have. And then it shows you who the children of the children are. So it would be like the grandchildren of the first husband and wife you were starting with and so on. So with the Greek gods, it all gets very interesting because different people marry different husbands and wives and have other children by them, but you're going to use this sheet that you take together and draw a line, probably in a dark color. So again, we said you can put a sky up at the top and 
planet Earth. We want to try to center it so that it comes out centered. I'm not going to use a ruler for this, but you probably should. Here we're going to draw a globe, mm -hmm. which looks nothing like a globe. And over here we're going to draw a cloud, which looks a little bit like a cloud. And you can label that. And then they give birth to Cronus. You can spell that by looking at your sheet. And Rhea. Okay, so then they are married, and they have children. And that's what gives us the next row of gods and goddesses under which we are going to have Zeus and Hera. And we're not going to get real specific about who is the father of who. We're just going to put them on there. I have to see if they fit. You have to make sure that you space them out so that you can get your gods on there, all six of them across. And then we're going to even have more to put on in the next row. So if you put Zeus at the middle and Hera on his side, I'll show you what I'm doing here in just a second because I gotta get it glued on or you're not gonna be able to see it. Because I have to be able to lift it up. But there are all kinds of amazing stories out there about the Greek myths that I hope we get to share together and learn about them and how they are still such a big part of our society today. They're not necessarily what we believe in, our religious beliefs, but they are really amazing stories full of adventure and excitement. Okay, so this is what I did. And you can go on and do the other six and then have a little line coming down from them and do the other ones all the way across the bottom if you want to do it all today. Or like I said, just add to it each week as we go and we learn about the different gods. Yours will probably look much nicer. I'm not taking the time to fully tell it everything right now because you guys are sitting here. And I want to go through the rest of the things in our packet. But you have this sheet that shows you how to do it. And you have this sheet that gives you a little bit more of a close-up view of how they are pasted on there. Okay, we have a word search included in this packet with the names of the gods and goddesses from Mount Olympus to find under there. And Eris is a god of love, not always listed under them because he's kind of Aphrodite's son, so he doesn't really have his own throne. He is what the Roman myths called Cupid. So you see that on Valentine's Day cards a lot. You'll see that coming up. He's the little cherub angel type character pulling a bow and filling people with arrows of love. But they listed him because he is so close to his mother Aphrodite. So there are word search you can do and then there's a site you can go to and read an online myth about Zeus and Hera. And you can print out and read a cool page from the book that I just showed you, Treasury of Greek Mythology. We did not do this page in the book about Zeus, king of the gods, but you can do it on your computer if you don't have a copy of the book at home. That one you can print out. There are one or two other things I wanted to share with you. We have a book at the library called Weird But True, know-it-all Greek mythology, and there's a page in here on each of the gods. I thought there might be some facts on here that would be kind of fun. Uh, Zeus was said to be so strong that he could single-handedly beat a team of all the other gods in a tug-of-war, and that's what we read. He was supposed to be stronger than all of them put together. Modern mythology golden god swimmer Michael Phelps may have rightfully earned all 28 of his Olympic medals, 
but he can give a little credit to Zeus for all of that blame. After all, without the king of gods, the Olympics may not even have existed. Why? Because the very first Greek Olympics held in the city of Olympia in 776 BC celebrated and honored Zeus. And those games featuring events like running, wrestling, and chariot racing are said to have inspired the modern Olympics, which began in Athens, Greece in 1896. So everyone today that is an Olympic champion has the Greek myths to thank for that. Weatherman, it says, did a thunderstorm cancel your outdoor birthday party? Blame Zeus. As the god of the sky and thunder, he controlled the world's weather, including wind, clouds, rain, thunder, and lightning. But he only unleashed the bad stuff as punishment for someone he believed crossed him. Like the time he hurled a lightning bolt at Ixion, a doctor, after Ixion fell in love with Zeus's wife, Hera. So, why he's weird, it says at the bottom, Zeus would use lightning bolts to strike down his enemies. That's one of his claims to fame. Uh, here we got some of the gods from Zeus. I had this Hera page marked as well. Let's find out a little bit about Hera. Proud as a peacock. Look closely at a peacock's distinctive tail feathers and you may notice many colorful eye markings. The ancient Greeks came up with a story about how they got there. According to myth, Hera had a 100-eyed giant servant named Argus who met an untimely death at the hands of Hermes. To honor Argus for all of his service to her, Hera placed each of his 100-eyed servant peepers, that means his eyes, on the tail of a peacock, and that's what we read about. Move over. Hera was so clever, not even Zeus could conceal much from her, although he tried. In an attempt to keep one of his mortal wives, Eo, a secret, he changed her into a small white cow. And that's what we read about with the tales of the peacock and the Argus. Oh, my, Hera was a jealous one. So, just some facts about the two of them. And I have, to end with, I have a Greek poem about these guys that we are reading about about Zeus mighty Zeus was king of the gods Poseidon ruled the sea Hades ruled the underworld they were the reigning three Zeus controlled the weather with power good and bad he'd throw his mighty thunderbolts whenever he got mad Though mighty Zeus was king of gods, revered all over Greece, his wife, the goddess Hera, would never give him peace. Whenever Zeus was gone too long, his wife would fume and fuss, because back in Greece, the ancient gods had problems just like us. So, we'll find out about what some of those problems are in future weeks. That's it for tonight. You have a bunch of activities you can work on. There are hundreds of wonderful Greek mythology books available through all the different libraries in Allegheny County that you can request and have sent right to Shaler and then we'll tell you when they're there and you pick them up even though we're not open to come in and browse. Some of the best ones are Daralari's Book of Greek Myths, D-A-U-L-A-U-R-E-S, and National Geographic's Treasury of Greek Mythology. So all you need to do is go online and order them, put them on hold for yourself, or call the library and anyone there will be happy to do it for you. And then you can be reading along with us or learning more about the Greek myths on your own. I encourage you to do that because they are awesome and amazing. And I hope you'll stay tuned for the next program and see which gods we're gonna focus on then. Until then, I hope everyone stays safe. Has a great time learning more about the Greek myths. This has been Miss Kathy from Shaler North Hills Library. Bye.